And so that's the kind of theme of the next hour, hour and a half, is challenges for AI in biomedicine. Um, we're going to start off this afternoon session with a keynote talk from Professor Bin Yu, who is the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Statistics and EECS and CompBio at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and Bin has really been uh, a very central figure in the practice and theory of statistical machine learning and data science theory in developing fundamental new methods all, you know, all the way through, um, and also practice in that she's very interested in this idea of trying to use machine learning, use data science to actually solve difficult scientific problems. Um, Bin is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, she has been uh, you know, very, a very prolific academic and more, most recently um, advocating for this idea of veridical data science as a crucial part of advanced machine learning systems. So if we could all welcome Bin to the podium. introduction and also inviting me. So in case you don't know what vertical means, it means truthful. When my friend Tian Zhang from Columbia suggested the name, I didn't know either, so I looked it up. It's not commonly used in um, English, but it's very common in Spanish. So this quote from Bill Gates from 2019 resonates very much what I feel about AI. It's like nuclear energy, both promising and dangerous. And data science has been a pillar of AI. Most of the advances in AI actually use data. You want to maximize the positives and minimize the negatives. I think we have two approaches for the data science process. One is pre preventative, one is damage control. I think what I'm advocating here should be used for both. So let's take a step back more the traditional data science statistics and machine learning. But the lowest is reality. And we have data, which is approximation. But we also always keep in touch with what we want to use the algorithm for, the future data, future decision, and the algorithms are really mental constructs. I think it's very healthy to think them in three levels. And domain knowledge cross all three. So that's kind of a pretty high, high level how we want to work on traditional machine learning and statistics. So I want to motivate my last uh, 15 years or so have been a lot uh, now we might call medical AI or medical machine learning. And process cancer is like the counterpart of breast cancer for men. About 12% people develop uh, process cancer in their lifetime and the death rate by 2.5. Right now there's something called PSA, process specific antigen, that men after 55 should do this test. But there's high rate of false positives and then you follow with invasive biopsies and sometimes actually don't need treatment, so over treatment. Can we do better? The second case study is a long running for five years with the Biohub, uh, Chan Zuckerberg. It's really finding genetic drivers, uh, HCM, which is a particular genetic heart disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's characterized by the left ventricle heart wall getting thicker, so it's harder to pump and also the volume of the left ventricle also gets smaller. You also have less blood. So the result can be fatal. And previous work showed that actually the cell size had a lot to do with this uh, condition. And it happens in one in 500 people in the US. So both my team comes in as data science problem. We want to find better tests for prostate cancer, what data to use. Here we use more traditional data, a few hundred, a thousand, data points and private data, and then, but you want the future. We're not gonna only treat this patient already in your study. We really want everybody in the US, in the world, men over 55, benefit from this. But we usually don't have that. We don't have the future men. So we have external validation as a proxy, right? It's something not in your data from another center, so that's pretty good proxy if you look at the medical establishment. Every step of the way, the people making judgment calls. We make lots and lots of judgment calls. The second problem is more interesting because it's more expanded. We want to find genes interacting to drive this disease. Similar things, but then the proxy data we're gonna use for the validation is actually gene silencing experiments in the VAT lab. 
And who is really the future use of this? It's pretty unclear. I want this idea to go into drugs to treat people, but it's not really quite easy to articulate. So it's kind of fundamental research. But we do want something to justify or prove this causality, this gene sexually drive. So we go to other kind of data, which is not in my data set, which is doing intervention experiment with stem cells and things like that. Both of them can be viewed as part of data science life cycle. And this is during the pandemic when I had a bigger group. We haven't taken any photo after that. And this process view, I think it's very, very important to think about data science life cycle. Suppose whatever I will come up with with my collaborator on prostate cancer, your family member use it. Would you only care about the modeling stage? Or would you care about the whole process? I hope all of you will care about the whole process. Because one thing I could do in the processing step, actually I'll run an algorithm, I delete all the data points that my algorithm doesn't work. I get 100%. Do you think it's gonna work for your relatives or yourself? So that's extreme case. But something we do kind of similar, we clean the data. And you clean away too much, if you don't clean, it's bad data. If you clean too much, it's too unrealistic. So just, we hope to find a sweet spot. And there's a lot of judgment calls. So every step, it's a source of uncertainty in modern terms. So if you want trust, you need to quantify your uncertainty in a realistic way. Suppose I said, the chance of your develop prostate cancer is 90%. You're probably gonna worry. But then I said, actually, I only have uncertainty from zero to 100. You probably don't want to worry too much. I don't really know what I'm talking about. So uncertainty quantification is a key whether we trust something or not, and in the context. So that's why we look at the whole data and life cycle. And traditions, this is only considered sample to sample variation when you have a good stochastic model. And often we don't. We don't check the models, predictions, one thing, but other things, we don't check the whole model. So I want you to leave this um, room, at least with these two big elephants. We have uncertainty not accounted for from data cleaning. We have uncertainty not accounted for because we make different judgment calls or team effect on different algorithms. There are many, many other, but that's what we try to address. So where's the evidence for underestimation uncertainty for data cleaning? I did this experiment with my class two years ago. Three teams of students, each had a medical doctor from, it's an ER room about traumatic brain injury, whether to send the kid to CT or not, because you send too much radiation, you don't send enough, you might miss bleeding. And we cleaned the data, we they get, all have instructions, have doctor expertise, and three teams come up with different versions. And we duplicated more. The, Uncertainty from data cleaning choice is about the same as if Bootstrap one clean data. So poor quality usually lead to high level uncertainty from data cleaning, which usually we just put under the rug. We don't formally address it. How about algorithm choices? There are now two papers last year. I mean, I started on this part 10 years ago. This is just godsend for pushing the uh, very vertical data science. 73 teams of qualified social scientists look at the same data for the same hypothesis, get results all over the place, positive or negative. In a completely different field, in ecology, evolution biology, two data sets, now are 74 teams of people. Similarly, same data, different analysis, and you get different variation uh, effect sizes because the analytical model decisions people make. So this is completely uh, now to the surface, even to the public and the scientific community. So people like us have to do better. What are the bad consequences of uncertainty estimation? Too many false positives, right? People send to prostate cancer unnecessarily. And we have science as the enterprise on shaky foundation because we want to build on each other's work. And we have unavoidable human cost, misled patients, financial costs, failed clinical trials, I mean, we cannot eliminate fails, failures, but we can make the high yields. We're gonna have trust problem in science and eventually funding problem. So um, Roy asked me when I asked his comments, how do I tailor to this audience? Maybe the large language model already solved my problem, so I tried, right? It actually gave pretty good data source. I was pleased, I never used it, but it's good, it, at least, you know, uh, teach CGG, some reason ones. 
And then I asked, well, how do I download? It says all the right things, but many, many, many suggestions. So the human judgment doesn't solve for me. And then how do you develop cancer prediction algorithm? Again, no general, you know, uh, generic stuff. And then many, many suggestions for each step. So again, it doesn't really help which one to use. So GPT cannot really tell us how to choose from many choices and doesn't recognize the many source uncertainty. Definitely never mentioned about underestimation uncertainty. And I think vertical science can do that through this PCS framework, predictability, computer stability. So for the rest of the talk, I want to give a very quick uh, overview of PCS and go back to the case studies and come back to current directions. So this is really for long Leo Brahman's work. Many of you probably heard about two cultures. Machine learning and statistics, one is more algorithm-based, the other is more generative model. We try to make it into one culture. The paper was with former student, Khan Kumbir. Take predictability, computability from machine learning and statistics, and hugely expand uncertainty quantification from statistics. That include control theory concept, numerical analysis concept to really unify and synthesize. It's a synthesis, it's a unification and expansion. Nobody has really wrote the book as we did, have a whole chapter on data cleaning. So it's really tried to be building on past work, make it more coherent based on basic principles and expand our uh, scope. So in the nutshell is you want reality check. P, why I developed this first couple of years ago was sort of about prediction from reality check. But now it means all kinds of reality check. Could be qualitative information could be subgroup prediction, not just the overall prediction. And stability is really about you have a system. You want to shake every part reasonably. Reason is very, very important. So I have a cell phone here, right? If I drop it, I hope it doesn't break because that's a reasonable shake. I go to the top of the building. I drop it, it's probably not reasonable. So that's what you have to make a judgment call. I'm not removing judgment call, but you write a document about it. And you should consider multiple stability metrics. So it's really a pluralism. Instead of moving away from optimality, we use optimization for sure, but you want the metrics and the approaches to be plural. And then you have to aggregate, right? Sometimes you want to take the intersection, sometimes you want to take the union, depends on which stage. And context. A lot of the judgment calls have to be made in context and with documentation. So I started falling in love with stability principle about 10 years ago. At the time, there was a bunch of works about irreproducibility of scientific results. And over 10 years, I expanded to include every step of the um, data science life cycle. And what's interesting, I, I have been working with people, ER doctor um, from um, uh, UCSF, Aaron Complice. We had a meeting with him, and we said, let's check on some literature about, because we're using, doctor's attention to do first step for some uh, ultrasound uh, diagnosis. He went ahead and then did a lot of research and came back and said, this is other papers. And uh, the people like me trained in transformers said actually the tension means the tension had. It's not human attention. So right there, we have two different interpretations for attention. In his world, attention is human attention. But in transformer, it's the tension had. So that's why when you have multidisciplinary teams, you need linguistic stability. People use the same word, means the same thing. And now we're also expanding stability as a prerequisite for interval machine learning because you don't want to interpret anything that is transient. So this is just saying that you need to understand data collection process so you can choose reasonable data perturbations and your document. And this is unify the traditional ones and include the new ones about adversary attacks from different randomization in deep learning training and different privacy data augmentation, so on and so on. So it's try to build a bigger tent, everything can be considered and discussed. Similarly about model perturbation, right? Robust statistics where it started, sensitivity, invasion analysis, and you have different randomization, you have different algorithms. So stability needs aggregation step, right? Do all these perturbations, and you need to look at the context. You decide sometimes you take a union in the beginning, you don't want to miss anything, and in the end you want to have a decision, you probably want to get agreement for all the good models. People often ask, how do I choose the perturbation? Because you can never go home if you do everything possible. So it's a matter level judgment cause. It was important to perturb. At least you have two versions of the data cleaning and then document it. And it's also related to the forking from uh, our earlier work by Gorman and Loken. So document, document, document. 
Is there a bridge between your mental construct and the reality? Maybe there isn't. Maybe just before the bridge was built, your job is to do quantitative and qualitative documentation. You cannot get reality check by using more mathematics. Narratives have to come in. So this is really liberal art critical thinking, not just technical thinking. You have to make good judgment calls, use good common sense. So to the prostate cancer, right? So we, you can use PCA to stress that existing work, something called MPS3 from a top prostate cancer group called My Score, My Prostate Score, um, Professor Chenayan's group, and my people also list here. By the time we introduced them, they already had a paper on ICAI. I think it's going to appear pretty soon in a, in a top journal. So they used about 700 patients from Michigan, and they already set the future data proxies as two cohorts at the time. One's from EDRN cohort from Hutchinson. The other later will have another cohort from uh, University of Michigan. It's important because the Hutchinson data is from a different state. You need that. You don't want everything from the same hospital. It's better the future Michigan data, but it's better to have something else from another. So they use added gene, gene expressions, 54 of them, and they trim down to 17. So the detail don't have, and they also use clinical variables. And they end up with use low gesture, um, elastic net, and got really good results. This is on validation, already external data. So they improve from the, what's being used, PSA, in terms of AUC curve by 21%. That's huge. And then their own method, called PMS, this is two, by 7%. And PCPC is another risk score by 15%. So this is a huge real improvement. However, if you remember from my first example from the students, if the variation is 10%, then the 7% improvement is not really there. So we went ahead and talked to Yu Ping, who is the data science on the team, about how she cleaned the data. You can see she made many judgment calls. There's something called the CT, it's called the cycle threshold. It's a how amplification RNA-seq data is done, right? And they decided whether to use the other risk score or whether use prostate volume because it's hard to measure. So they made many, many, many judgment calls. And if they make a different judgment, do you have a different result? And there are a bunch of algorithms they could have chosen. So identify the human judgment calls to stress test, and identify recent perturbations in discussion with sweeping, and we performed them. So we did the prediction check, the P, and then we did the stable ranking after the good, among the good models, and we also did a subgroup accuracy, kind of related to fairness. So here's the result. We did four different pipelines because there's limited resource. And you have four groups of methods on the right. The first is Lozeshi Elastinet, Lozeshi L1, Random Forest, Random Forest Plus. It's a new method from a group. Check it out. And Lozeshi L2. You can see that Lozeshi L2 just have lower AUC curve. So we screen that out because we want good models before we aggregate. The good news for uh, Chanayan's group that they are a good group. They, he's the PI of the whole uh, early cancer detection network, NIH, is only one to 2%. So they pretty know how to clean it. And therefore, the, the improvement is just clearly is real. Unlike the 10% I showed you. So then we have all these five different models, or four different models. All paths are good, you know, they have very similar performance. Then we did, each of them has a way to rank the very features, and we just stable averaged because we don't trust any particular one. That's like an intersection. So we end up with six or seven genes. The gene names probably don't make sense to you, which don't make that much sense to me either uh, yet. Maybe I'll get deeper into it. And then for the test data we have, get very, very similar results. So this is on one validation. So this is already kind of proxy feature data. Just look at the two numbers I draw a line. 17 genes plus cloning code get 81.8%. We with six or seven genes, we get 80.9%. So you say, well, there's a 1% difference. It is, 
But remember, the data cleaning can introduce one to two percent difference. So this is within even data cleaning. So that's why we call comparable. We had a second cohort from Michigan, a little smaller. Again, just look at the two numbers. Now the difference is only 0.1 percent, and it's well within the one to two percent, like data cleaning uncertainty. What time do I have? Ten, seven minutes, okay, great. Okay, so this is really shows that your stable ranking, we can improve because reduce cost, you don't have to collect 17 genes, you only need seven genes, and they pass our stress test of the, their uh, data cleaning. We have two proxy future data sets, the real future data is all the man in the United States. You will have feedback right, later, but we don't have that. But it's important to have external cohorts for now. I'll call the proxy future data. So case study two is a lot more uh, evolved, so I'll only give you the rhyme with other details. So we had to go back, get the new data, look at MRI, because the labels give random tosses, didn't pass the prediction check, we couldn't beat random toss. And then we developed improved random, e random forest, my group have been working on for the low signal case. And we only have 55% accuracy. I've never worked on so low prediction problem. But the ranking, ranking, still meaningful. And we look at annotated database, talk to the doctors, and we did experiments. So this is a very different kind of future data for the validation. And we work very hard with new data, and literature to come up with a mechanistic interpretation. So this is much more expanded. It's not just data science anymore because it involved the very lab experiments and more medical search. So this is more and more, I think we should use this. For low signal to noise cases, introduce other data because it won't pass p-values or anything statistical because, but the ranking is still informative. So it's a summary that we did a five sets experiment, we had 80% success rate. We basically find gene, gene interaction, and genes are causal because we intervened. And this particular two interactions of genes in blue, human genetics, very few epistasis, nonlinear interaction have been found. So this would be one of the early ones. And the papers, uh, the papers on archive. And we just revived for natural cardiovascular research. And I want to shout out for the two young researchers, Chen Ru, who is a postdoc with uh, Ashley, my former student, Tiffany Tan, become professor at Notre Dame, and my collaborator, uh, cardiology, you and Ashley. And many, many other collaborators, I have a whole list. Um, so this is really uh, three years of work. We went to visit Ashley right before the pandemic. And the, paper, the response is to the uh, rare freeze was 38 pages. But we want people to build drugs on it. And I think it's, I really want us to do as much as we can to push. And PCS was crucial for this low signal case to get signals. So again, can large animal solve my problem, right? Actually, ChatGP gives pretty good data sets, pointers. I'm very happy with that. It has UK data bank there. Again, I said I have too many false negatives for the, for the labels. That's why we have to go for a different volume, like a phenotype. It just keeps wanting to improve label quality. It doesn't know that I cannot really change the labels because I don't have asset data. It doesn't have that external knowledge. It doesn't want to think about a different approach, right? It just wants to try to improve the classification problem. We just went ahead and have a different phenotype. So it's not very good at after the box. Again. I told like we have very close 50% accuracy what to improve. Again, it's just very generic. It doesn't really won't help us here. So the last five minutes, I want to go back to this traditional good framing I, I developed for undergraduate students. Every step is questionable. What's the model, right? Uh, you know, it's a generative and sometimes it's multitask. It's few shot and you know, it, it's not as clean cut. What's the data? Well, most time we don't know what ChatGPT used, right? And we don't even, cannot even describe it. A lot of data are private in medical, but people actually describe it. Try as much as you can without identification. A lot of good description are done. What instrument is used, all of that, even though it cannot give specific data. 
Future data, again, generative model, who's going to use it? How to validate it? Unclear. Is ChatGPT in fact a reality? We don't know. Maybe, maybe not. What decision will be made? So all of this, everything, every box, are left with a question mark. So with my uh, colleague from um, Berkeley, uh, here a lot, we're working on a paper. We really have to expand the thinking, basically a lot of super wide and super wide learning from traditional machine learning to cover foundation models. First, there's upstream, black, all black boxes. I have no clue. And they also turned the original data into instruction, some format. Again, we have curation, no clue. Downstream, we have lighter. I don't think it's completely white. There's still opaqueness. And it's constrained by the upstream because we had a paper showing that depending on what you feed the data might be good for different problems than others. So PCS, we believe, is more relevant than ever. Documentation is always there. I won't go there. We have numerous PCS issues in large amount of dollars. Right? What's reality check? Do we have benchmarks? At least I feel like the community outside just dictate what are the benchmarks, then the developer decide on, a, on their own. There's have a little bit of objectivity. I know benchmark has a problem. A previous um, speaker spoke about that. I completely agree, but let's do something. And I hope to have more um, in context kind of testing. And continuability, we have an efficiency problem. All the AI um, consumption of energy is not helping us to push back on climate change. Not at all. It might make it uncontrollable. It takes huge, so we need the research there to know how to perturb in the most efficient way, even I want for the PCS. And stability. I want to be able to do some perturbation. Maybe the outside can suggest something and the internal people explain it. So again, back to the early panel, the industry and university collaboration. And how do we have a path for PCS large language model framework? I think we need to borrow ideas from FDI-like thinking. It's different. But FDA, not FDI, FDA already has set rules for the drugs and the diagnosis and things like that. There are a lot to be borrowed. They have a lot of documentation before you even decide. We don't have any of that. We don't have any documentation of development, evaluation, monitoring, upgrading. And most kind of uh, concerning is that we don't even know the chat GPT I use today is the same I use tomorrow. It's like I take aspirin today. Tomorrow the pill might have a different formula. That's what uh, we're making available to some kids. We don't know what they're dealing with because I think freezing versions for evaluation need to happen if we're being responsible. And NSF is right to put in resource for resource pilot so that we can do Downstream, I also do some upstream perturbation in industry and collaboration and documentation. Okay, so to summarize, PCS is really a philosophy. It's very much embracing pluralism, move away from optimal, um, think we can really optimal. I mean, optimize my health, I completely would love, but optimize my life, I would say that no, I want some randomness. So that's a very much like I want optimal, um, not optimal, different choices, and sometimes just make a random uh, step. And we need documentation, and if you see some of this, where a lot of good teams are already doing stability, but we need to make it a habit. So the roles of PCS are really expanding, internal validity, stress testing, recommendation for causal validation. We actually have developed a slew of new algorithms, and we're extending to a large energy model development and piece of inference formal and searching quantification and other group already expanded to spatial data science, vertical network analysis, reinforcement learning. So my hope is that some of you will bring this idea to your product, to your research, and we have a meeting with Stanford in like six weeks at Berkeley. Go to my website, you'll find the link. We have five seats left on Friday, but we'll have a playlist. I hope some of you there in six weeks. And we have used academic, good academic software to help you to do uh, build down uh, like uh, ML flow from the Rice Lab in Berkey and Ray, and we also have uh, our simulation package. It's under the S, and both have 
appeared in journal software, um, open software. We have documentation templates you can take from our website. Just help especially beginners to write out the pipeline, what you want to do. And we have a book. Took us, me and my uh, former student, Professor Rebecca Butter at uh, Utah University, took us nine years. And uh, vdsbook.com is open access, but you can now download. Uh, MIT still you know, fairly want to make some money. And you can pre-order on Amazon. And it's really in, have a chapter on data cleaning and really cultivate both qualitative and quantitatively critical thinking. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Finn. That was a fascinating talk. Thank we have time for one question. Oh, um, sorry, I used up my time. No, no, we, and we started a little bit late. And so um, if the people for the next panel can slowly start coming up and, and sitting down. Um, do we have any questions from the crowd or the stream online? OK, if someone gets a mic to them. OK, the, the mics are off. OK, well, so I guess if no one has a question from the crowd, I have one. Sure, so thank the, you. I mean, there's a lot of focus at the moment in tech about um, trying to take that sort of decision making out of problem solving you know, by automating somehow, for example, with a, a society of lang large language models or something like that. Do, do you see any potentiality in that? Or is that going to be a dangerous approach? Or what are your thoughts on it? I'm kind of awful to take repetitive like vetted steps we have to do into automation, but I also want to see periodic checks on that. Yeah. So I think that humans should always lead the way at the frontier. When things become competitive, we have enough confidence through the policies, and we should definitely automate. I don't have any problem with that, but we should always go back. Your life is dynamic. Life doesn't stay the same. So you need to have this like quality control idea that you keep coming back to check it periodically, yeah. or there's a flag. But um, you know, I used to do multiplication in my head. Now I use you know, <laughs> the simplest. I use R, right? So, so things like that. I think. I think, but it's the vetting. It's what I think we need to put more energy on, yeah. and have a discussion. Have all the shareholders, like uh, shareholders, or whatever, uh, to be in the discussion. And then you need to have a process. And AI can also help on that to bring people together in the right way. So I see it as really AI as extensions of senses and assistance, but in a way that we vet what it does for us. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's thank Ben again. Thank you.